Our last portion of this um, uh, program will focus on how these uh, advances are being translated into the community. And Alan, I'd like to ask you your opinion about what percentage of newly diagnosed patients with advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer are actually having molecular testing done. So admittedly, I actually have no idea uh, as to what it is. I overheard some folks talking, so I'm, but I'll tell you what I had thought anyway, and, and uh, so to, to be honest, I thought it would be in excess of, of 40 to 50%. Um, in, the, in the community for testing at some point, maybe not immediately when they first see the patient, but that the testing was done. Um, my understanding may be different, but uh, that, that's what I'll stand by. Other comments? Uh, in the Delaware Valley, at least, I think it's probably a large minority uh, on the order of 30 to 40 percent. Over time, if patients uh, live long enough, it probably becomes a majority. But uh, again, most of this testing is exclusively in adenocarcinoma and select uh, squamous cell patients. So at the get-go, it's going to be less than two-thirds. So I think there's a few surveys that have estimated 20 to 25 percent of all lung cancer patients actually get some testing. Obviously, the goal and what the ISLAC and NCCN guidelines put out are that for all adenocarcinomas, we should be shooting for at least testing all of them um, for the EGFR and ALK mutations. So, Anne, is that 20 to 25 percent of the non squames Of all non-small cell. Right. So, th so that would be 30 to 35 percent or something, I suspect, of the non Of adenos. Of the non squames yeah. Very important mm -hmm. point is if we did not test um, adenocarcinomas who smoked, which is still the majority, we'd probably miss 40 percent or more of uh, EGFR mutations. That's, that's an excellent point. Um, actually, the the majority of patients that I have without fusion in their cancer are former smokers. Now, admittedly, they were light former smokers, and they may have quit 30 years ago, but I think that's a very important point is we shouldn't rule out testing somebody because of a prior smoking history. Absolutely. Agreed, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. There um, is also an issue about um, community hospitals and academic centers and whether all of us are in academic centers, whether this is an academic issue and that means that in the community this is not evolving into a standard of care. Um, Mark, wh what do you think about this? No, I, I, I think obviously in academic centers where you have physicians like us who do solely lung cancer um, and are involved in clinical trials, I think the uh, penetration of testing is uh, significantly higher. I mean, almost all of our patients get tested. But it brings up another point, David, is, and that is uh, who orders the testing. Um, I don't have to do that at my institution. Uh, all samples are reflexively um, tested for these sorts of things. I think that's at the community level, I think there are a number of barriers uh, to getting testing done. One is adequate tissue. Secondly, the medical oncologist thinking about it. Uh, thirdly, a pathologist who's willing to deal with it and send it out and cut the right things and this and that, and often what they often don't get reimbursed for these sorts of things, so it becomes priority number 26 when you already have 25 more things to do, and I think these are huge barriers. So, so I think there's variability at the community level. I think that's changing. You know, you've mentioned previous guidelines from the uh, uh, pathology organizations and molecular pathology organizations that will change that. Um, but, but I think at the community level, there tend to be more barriers um, than there are in academic centers. I, I think in the community, the onus, by and large, is on the medical oncologist. Right. Uh, right. Because they're far more aware of uh, these factors than many of the pathologists, and it really right. requires the oncologist to initiate the conversation. We have the privilege of uh, having academic pathologists who uh, are perhaps a bit more in line with uh, current uh, standards. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we have one of the joys of practicing where I do is uh, outstanding molecular pathologist who who are, are doing this reflexively and get this information efficiently, and I don't have to ask for it. I don't have to worry about it. Whereas, you know, if you're the if you're if you've got a slot of 30 patients to see today and you're busy and you're going from room to room, and 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 you you know Mrs. Jones doesn't have adequate tissue for testing. Are you going to re-biopsy? What are you going to do? Are you going to have time to deal with the pathology issues and doing that? It, it really is a challenge, I think. 